morning. It's nine o'clock. I want to welcome you to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center virtual field trips. We want to spend a special welcome to Griner Middle School, Jose Joe May Mavericks, and Zan Wesley Holmes Middle School. Thank you for joining us on this old cold wintry morning. If, if you just click on the screen, it'll go forward. Okay, sorry. Uh, if you have not registered for this program, we'd appreciate if you would, www.tiny.cc slash EEC register. And we need that just for our attendance records. This morning, we're gonna do a program called Renewable and Non-Renewable Resources. During this virtual field trip, students will discover that some of Earth's energy resources are available on a nearly perpetual basis. Others can be renewed over a relatively short period of time. And some energy resources, once depleted, are essentially non-renewable. Ms. Fuller will tell you all about fossil fuels. Mr. Monroe will discuss nuclear energy. Mr. Broughton will tell you about biomass, wind, and hydropower, and geothermal and solar energy will be discussed by Ms. Ramirez. During the program, if you have any questions, if you will, go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC space question space answer. And now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Ms. Fuller will tell us all she knows about fossil fuels. Hello, boys and girls. My name is Mrs. Fuller. I'm going to be talking to you about fossil fuels. So uh, let me share my screen with you. And I'm going to be talking to you about non renewable resources, coal, oil, natural gas. Um, I will show you a picture of some uranium that Mr. Uh, Monroe is going to talk to you about uh, uh, nuclear energy. Okay, so uh, of our um, uh, fossil fuels, the non-renewable energy, coal is probably the one that uh, pollutes the most. We've got three different kinds, lignite, bituminous, and anthracite. This is a picture of a lignite mine here in Texas, in Fairfield, Texas. Um, lignite is the kind of coal we have here. It's very soft, it's very dusty, it's dirty. Uh, it pollutes a lot, both particulate and carbon dioxide and methane. Then we have bituminous coal, which is the kind of coal we have in Wyoming and Kansas. This is harder, it doesn't pollute as much. Uh, it's also got more carbon, so it burns hotter. Then we have anthracite uh, coal, like in uh, West Virginia and uh, Pennsylvania. It's very deep in the ground. It's very difficult to get to. It's expensive and it's dangerous to mine it. Then we have petroleum. We've got a huge uh, uh, oil and gas industry here in Texas. And um, uh, the, what the picture on the top is a picture of a, a refinery in Pasadena, Texas. And you can see stuff coming out of the smokestack. Uh, they burn uh, a lot of the waste gas. So that also adds to it. And uh, also uh, as far as polluting is concerned, if you'll look at the bottom on the right hand side, you will see um, an oil spill from transporting the petroleum, it uh, sometimes gets spilled, which is very um, dangerous for marine life. Then we've got natural gas. Natural gas actually burns cleaner than coal and petroleum, but it still does add carbon dioxide and methane to the 
uh, atmosphere. And of course, we've got the fracking issues with it also. We have, they have learned how to break the shale that the natural gas is trapped in by uh, forcing water with chemicals and breaking up the shale. They capture the gas, but um, uh, it, it still uh, has some negative connotations. And, and then this is a picture of uranium and then the uranium plant here in, in Texas. And I'm gonna let Mr. Uh, uh, Monroe talk more about that. I'm gonna show you some pictures. Uh, well, it's not pictures, I'm gonna show you some coal. This is lignite coal. This is what we have here in Texas. There's a big seam of it going from East Texas to Central Texas diagonally across the state. Burns very dirty. And this is by Tumnus. That's the coal they have in uh, Wyoming and uh, Kansas. And this is the very hard coal that burns cleaner, but still pollutes. And um, the anthracite uh, is, uh, has a very high carbon content. So it, it does uh, burn very hot. Now I'm gonna tell you a few statistics uh, about, uh, about a third, maybe 31% of the carbon dioxide um, pollution comes from coal and about 58 comes from petroleum and natural gas. Uh, about 85% of the partic particulate pollution. Now these are global, um, these are global um, percentages, not Texas or United States percentages. Remember, we're, we live, all live on one planet and everything we do and everything everybody else does affects all. And uh, so about 85% of the particulate uh, pollution comes from coal, oil, and gas. And then as far as methane is concerned, methane uh, is a greenhouse gas that is 25 times more uh, uh, sunlight trapping, greenhouse uh, uh, effect than uh, carbon dioxide, but uh, it breaks down a lot faster than carbon dioxide. Now, the number one contributor to methane is agriculture, but uh, the oil and gas industry is right behind at number two. So uh, if you have any questions, I'm going to turn this over to Ms. Uh, Doctor, Dr. Gorman and let him answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Fuller. Yes, we did have a question, and it, the question is, will we ever run out of fossil fuels? Yes. I don't hear you. I'm not muted. I can, I can hear you. I think you're good. Okay. <clears throat> will we ever, the question is, will we ever run out of fossil fuels? And the answer is yes. Uh, we are rapidly running out of fossil fuels, and we are really working on industries to provide additional uh, or supplemental uh, fuels for electricity and stuff. Now we're going to hear from Mr. Monroe about nuclear energy. Good morning, students. My name is Mr. Monroe, and... Your, my part of your virtual field trip today is that we're going to be looking at nuclear energy. And of course, nuclear energy, we're talking about nuclear fuel that is provided by a mineral called uranium. Uh, uranium is what we consider to be radioactive. And before I share my screen with you and get into the PowerPoint, I just want to share some things with you about uranium. Right here in the state of Texas, the state of Texas is rich and abundant with different minerals. We even have a area where uranium is being mined. And I don't know whether you can see the map real plain, but this map shows that the pink is an indicator that the, that's where 
uranium can be found in our state. And these deposits are somewhere between Laredo and Corpus Christi. Now, I'm going to share my screen with you all and attempt to share my screen with you all. And we'll walk through uh, nuclear energy and how it happens, okay? Okay, nuclear energy, guys. In uh, developing nuclear energy, there's a process that we call nuclear fission. Nuclear fission is the process of splitting a nucleus into two nuclei with small masses, smaller masses. Fission means to divide. Remember that fission has twos. Therefore, if it splits into two parts, Only large nuclei with atomic numbers above 90 can undergo fission. Products of fission at reaction usually include two or three individual neutrons. The total mass of the product is somewhat less than the mass of uranium-235. A chain reaction is an ongoing series of fission reactions. Billions of reactions occur each second in a chain reaction. A neutron is about to hit the nucleus of a uranium atom. The uranium nucleus splits into several smaller atoms, releasing heat and several more neutrons. The chain reaction begins. Those neutrons hit other nuclei, causing them to fission, and so on. On Earth, nuclear fission reactions take place in nuclear reactors, which use controlled chain reactions to generate electricity. So most of the nuclear power that we use, or nuclear energy that we use, is used to develop electrical energy. Uncontrolled chain reactions take place during the explosion of the atomic bomb. And that's why we have a lot of mixed feelings or some people take pause because they hear the word nuclear, okay? You look at this cartoon, nuclear power is a good temporary option while we develop wind and solar power. The products of nuclear fission reactions are radioactive, but the energy released from these reactions is less harmful to the environment than the use of fossil fuel. The products are intensely radioactive and must be treated and stored. And that's a disadvantage of using nuclear energy. Nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is the combining of the two nuclei with low masses to form one nucleus of larger mass. Nuclear fusion reactions are also called thermonuclear reactions. Now, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll talk a little bit more about talk a little bit more about nuclear energy. Now, students listen. Nuclear power plants have been around for quite a while. I was doing a little research and I ran into a question and this question asked, why is Arco, Idaho famous? Well, I found out by doing a little research that Arco, Idaho is famous for being the world's first nuclear power city. You know what? It lasted about 91 days. I also wanted to find out when the first nuclear reactor had been developed. And the first nuclear reactor that was recorded was built in Chicago, it was called Chicago Power One. 
And it was built in the year of 1942 by a Nobel Peace Prize winner by the name of Enrico Fermi. It was built, guess where? Underneath the University of Chicago's football field. Now, again, the most common nuclear fuel that is used in the reactors is uranium. Energy is again released when nuclei of the atoms are split. When we combine those, guess what? We call it fusion. Now, the disadvantages of this is that it produces dangerous waste, radioactive material, and it has to be stored because it can stay radioactive or harmful to uh, life thousands of years. Now, the other disadvantage is that water has to be used in this process of splitting that atom in a reactor. And when that water is expelled, it is super hot and it can be dangerous if it is released back into local bodies of water at that temperature. So before that water can be released back into local bodies of water, it has to be cool before it's released into the lakes. Now, you might say, well, do we have any nuclear power plants around here? Guess what? We do have one that's pretty close. It is called Luminant Forney Station. It's located in Forney, Texas. There's another that's not very far away and it's called Comanche Peak. And it's located down around Stevensville, Texas. Now, hopefully I've given you a little bit of information about nuclear energy and uh, hopefully I've helped you learn a little bit about it. And I want you guys to have a good virtual field trip the rest of the day. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Gorman. So hopefully if you have any questions, he'll be able to answer those for you. All right, Mr. Gorman. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. We do have a question. Uh, do, can we name another use of nuclear power uh, besides for producing electricity? And I have a personal relationship with that. Many years ago, I was in the Navy and I flew in a search and rescue helicopter around over the oceans. And we would land on this huge aircraft carrier called the Enterprise. And it was nuclear powered. Everybody, the sailors always told us that we'd probably later on in life, we'd probably lose our hair for being exposed to this nuclear power. But if you can see me, you can see that's not true. It didn't affect my hair at all. Now we're gonna let Mr. Broughton tell us about biomass, wind, and hydropower. Thank you, Dr. Gorman. I'm gonna share my screen here real quick and uh, get started with biomass, wind, and hydropower. So we're gonna start off with just looking at how the United States generates electricity. Um, this is how the United States has generated electricity from 2001 to 2019, so you can see it used to be mostly coal. Now it is mostly natural gas, but coal is still second. Nuclear is third. Uh, wind has moved into fourth and hydroelectric or the hydropower is fifth. And that yellow is solar. And um, I'm not sure what the light gray color is, uh, but I, and I don't think biomass is even making it onto this graph. We, we don't make a lot of electricity from biomass here in the United States. And if we visit that website um, where I uh, got that graph, uh, you can see again, like what I just said, natural gas has edged out coal um, in recent years, um, but renewables like wind and solar are making gains. Um, there's uh, how Nevada makes their uh, electricity. You can see a lot of natural gas. In Iowa, um, they get quite a bit from wind. West Virginia, almost all their electricity comes from coal. And let's go down to Texas. You can see in 2001, Texas made most of their uh, electricity from natural gas. And today we still make most of our electricity from natural gas. And we'll even go visit Texas here and see how we make our electricity. So 45% is made by natural gas, 30% is made by coal. Wind though has been increasing uh, over the years. I mean, going back to 2001, almost no electricity was made from wind. And now uh, we make 15% uh, of our electricity from wind and then 9% is nuclear. And uh, 
Speaking of wind, uh, in 2014, wind took over nuclear power as the third largest source of electricity produced in the state. Texas produces more power from wind in total than any other state with Oklahoma and Iowa in second and third place. So we do produce a lot of wind, um, or a lot of electricity from wind um, here in Texas. So I'm gonna go back to the presentation here and we're gonna look at wind energy a little bit closer. So uh, all around the world, there are wind farms and Texas has three of the 10 largest uh, wind farms in the world. So number, the sixth largest wind farm in the world is right here in Texas. It's found 45 miles Southwest of Abilene, Texas. And that's the Roscoe Wind Farm. It consists of 627 wind turbines and altogether they generate 781.5 megawatts of electricity. And then number seven in the world, also here in Texas is the Horse Hollow Wind Energy Center. Um, it's located near uh, Taylor, Texas, not Tyler, Taylor, Texas. Uh, it consists of 421 wind turbines and they produce 735.5 megawatts of electricity. And then number eight in the world is the Capricorn Ridge Wind Farm located in Sterling and Coke counties here in Texas. It consists of 407 wind turbines and they generate 662.5 megawatts of electricity. So we do produce a lot of electricity from wind here in Texas. Now, when we look, think about wind energy, there is uh, land-based uh, wind farms, but there are also um, offshore wind farms. So uh, number nine in the world and the largest offshore wind farm in the world is the Walney Extension Offshore Wind Farm that is located in the Irish Sea. Uh, next to um, England. It consists of 87 wind turbines and it generates 659 uh, megawatts of electricity. So there, there's onshore wind farms, but there are also offshore wind farms. And the advantage of putting them offshore is that there's no trees or even land to block that wind. The disadvantage is that they are even more expensive than onshore to build and maintain. Um, I mean, as you can imagine, the salt water uh, eats it away at them and, um, you, you know, it's not easy to get to them. You have to take a boat. It's not easy, not easy to work on them because you don't have land to stand on, but they do uh, generate a lot of electricity once you have them up and running. And one disadvantage of wind is that maybe it's not going to blow one day, but something I found when I was researching wind energy is uh, this thing here, which I'll play it's like about a one minute clip of this video uh what that is is a tower of cement blocks and there are six cranes at the top of that and they can drop those cement blocks down to the bottom or lift them back up and they'll in times of uh windy days when these wind turbines here are generating almost like well too much electricity for the grid this tower will raise those blocks up and, and put them at the top. And then on days when the wind's not blowing, it can lower them down. And that gravitational potential energy uh, um, creates electricity. So it's stored energy um, that's going on with that. Now, this is a um, just a conceptual video. They haven't actually built this yet, but they did get funding to build it. So um, we'll see if it works because that's, uh, that's unusual. I'd never heard of anything uh, like that. So that is wind energy. Now we're going to move on to uh, hydropower. And there are some different types of hydropower. So this first one here is called run of river hydropower. That's kind of your classic, you know, build a dam and let the water flow through it. It's going to turn this turbine to generate electricity that will then get sent out to the cities. Uh, they, they usually build these um, where there are rivers and uh, we do not produce a lot of hydropower here in Texas, um, mo mainly because we just don't have um, the rivers and the, the terrain to do that. So we do have a, like a little bit of electricity from hydropower in Texas, but not a lot. Other places do have a lot. Um, in fact, I meant to go back to uh, South Dakota, which I was, I was surprised it produces a lot of electricity through hydropower. And I would never have guessed that, but that's one state that does. Uh, so there's a picture of how one of those um, run of river hydropower stations looks. That one is actually in Madagascar, which is that large island next to Africa. But you can see they've got a large river here to, that they dammed up. 
and then the terrain surrounding it with these hills, it gives them a natural place to hold that water and they can produce quite a bit of electricity. I think, I think that dam provides about 8 million homes with um, clean um, electric energy. And then the next type of uh, hydropower is, it's called storage hydropower and sometimes pumped storage hydropower. And what this is, is they've built a huge reservoir up here and they let water go through a pipe. It turns the turbine that, do, that makes the generator gener generate electricity and they can send it into the grid to homes. And uh, the water that flows through goes into a, a lower reservoir. But pumped storage means that in times of uh, like, let's say these wind turbines here and these solar panels here are generating more electricity than people can use. They'll use that energy to pump water back up into that upper reservoir so they can use it again uh, and it won't go empty. So that was, I've, I'd really never heard of that until I did, did some of this research. And there's how one looks uh, for real. So you can see here's that large reservoir um, at a higher level than this river. So in this example, they did not use a reservoir, but they're using a river. There's the power station. And uh, it looks like the pipe probably got put straight down this way, as my guess, down to this river to generate electricity. And then if you notice here, they've cut down all the trees underneath these power lines because they um, get, you know, so they don't get hit by the branches and things like that. Uh, but they, uh, send the electricity out from out to the cities from there. So that was kind of a di different one. And that's located in Massachusetts. I don't believe we have any of those here in Texas. And um, then we also have offshore hydropower. Uh, so you can have um, turbines above the water to, to use the wind, but you can put turbines underwater to use ocean currents or tides. So there's another uh, example of how um, we can use hydropower. Uh, again, these have got to be pretty expensive, I would imagine, to build. And then here's a picture of a real one. And so you can see there, they are not small. Um, I mean, that's not a huge boat or anything, but these propellers are quite large. They can raise them up to work on them or then lower them back under water to uh, generate electricity. And there, this one is uh, located in Northern Ireland. So they're, they're generating electricity that way. And uh, just to kind of recap, uh, wind and um, hydropower, uh, these are the top 10 renewable energy, electricity generating states by source. So uh, California generates a lot of electricity and Washington, I guess New York, Oregon are kind of the top hydroelectric uh, states. And then you can see Texas is number one in wind by a lot. Uh, and then like that other article showed, Oklahoma is uh, second and Iowa is third and Kansas is pretty close, but Texas generates um, a lot of uh, electricity by wind. For biomass, uh, California does generate a good amount, but not, not that much compared to how else they can generate electricity. Texas just a little bit, Washington a little bit, some of the other states not not a whole lot with biomass. And we're gonna get into biomass and you'll kind of understand why um, we don't generate lots and lots of electricity with biomass. So when we say biomass, bio means life, mass is the amount of matter in an object. So uh, garbage could be considered biomass because if you throw away food scraps, that's biomass. Wood is biomass, but we don't burn wood um, for energy very much. I mean, you might have a wood burning fireplace at home, but that's that's not really what's heating your home. Um, we mostly use wood as, as lumber to build things. Crops are biomass, but we eat most of our crops. Uh, landfill gas. So if you, when you throw garbage away in the landfill, all those food scraps decompose and give off um, methane gas. And then we can use that sometimes or if we don't, it just escapes into the into the atmosphere. And then alcohol fuels uh, can be turned into, um, can be burned for energy. And I'll show you an example of that in a slide coming up here, but that's, so those are types of biomass. But again, we don't produce a lot of electricity because it's just not that um, efficient to, to do. But uh, in doing some research on biomass, 
this is something that um, a few farms are trying. It's it's just not very easy though, but they collect, they collect all the manure from their cows and uh, they put it into what's called an anaerobic digester. And this is airtight chamber that, that digests or breaks down that manure and produces gas. Then it gets um, refined here and it could get sent out into the um, national pipeline where it can be used, but it's just very difficult to do. And this, this container here is, um has got to be huge to to uh burn and break down all that manure it's not very easy to do uh something else that is extremely unusual uh that really i they did this just to see if they could do it i think is um when cows belch they belch out methane gas uh in fact cows are responsible for 25 percent of the methane gas in our atmosphere and that's one of the worst um uh like heat trapping gases in our atmosphere. So what the what they did at this farm was they attached a hose to a, one of these cows stomachs where that gas would be would eventually get belched out but they instead of getting belched out it goes into this backpack and they uh, store it there and use it. But again, that's just not very practical. I, um, uh, they just did it to see if they could do it. I don't, th this is not being used um, really by anybody um, outside of, I think that one farm and that's a farm in Argentina where they did that and uh, working with the university just to see if it was possible, but uh, not very practical at all. And uh, E85 is probably something you've seen um, in Texas. That is uh, the, the um, turning corn into a fuel. So what E85 means is this, this, um, if you push this button, the gas here is a, a, like 50 to close to 85% ethanol, which comes from corn mixed with gas. Uh, so it is a, um, a more renewable fuel source because it's coming from corn, but um, some people don't like it because your gas mileage is not gonna be as good with E85 fuel. So it's a lot more expensive to drive anywhere and it's harder on your uh, parts of your engine. So your, your engine breaks down faster than if you use regular gas. But it is something that we are trying even here in Texas because we do uh, grow a lot of corn here in the United States. In fact, you will find, you'll see E85 in the central United States. So Texas all the way up to Minnesota. If you go to the West Coast or the East Coast where they don't grow as much corn as the Midwest, you won't see E85 because it's just not uh, as available as it is here. And then uh, last is another uh, biofuel um, that they're trying to develop, and that is from algae. So when algae grows, it does give off an oil, and you can collect that oil and refine that oil and turn that into a fuel. So that is a huge algae farm. I'm not sure where this is. I, I tried to find out where this was, but I couldn't. But there's a, like a zoomed in picture so they've got these tanks of water and the water looks green because that's the uh, microscopic algae plant that is growing in it. And uh, they eventually put it in giant test tube looking things to refine it. And they can turn that into a fuel, but right now we don't use that because I don't think it can work in vehicles as we make them now. And uh, I think the cost of this, even at their best production is like $8 a gallon. And right now we're paying about $2 a gallon for gas. So if we quadrupled the price, that would um, not be, you know, people just won't buy it. So those are um, some biofuels and uh, biomass. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, Dr. Gorman to see if you have any questions. Yes, thank you, Mr. Broughton for that very interesting thing. Now we have a Holstein cow here on the property, but I don't think I'm gonna fix up a rig like that on her. I don't think she would go for it very much. Uh, my question is, have I seen any of these uh, power generating facilities? And yes, I did. When I was going across, or by the, across the Panama Canal one time a few years back, they had one of them where they gathered water up on, in a little lake up on top of the mountain and they sent it down through this pipe to turn the generator. Now they could only do it, there was two little streams they said that fed the lake and they, it, when the 
water got to a certain height, they would release it into this pipe, which would in turn turn the generator. When it got to a certain level, they would cut it off. So they only had electricity whenever the water level was high enough. So they had to cut it off during the day, let the water level fill back up, and then they would generate electricity again. So they didn't have gener electricity being generated like we do, where 24 hours a day, you could turn the light on. You could only turn it on when the water was falling down through the pipe and running the generator. Now we're going to hear from Ms. Ramirez about geothermal and solar energy. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez and we're gonna be learning about uh, geothermal and solar energy. So to start, I have a quick little demonstration for you guys to think about uh, before we do our presentation. So here I have a solar panel connected to a fan uh, that's attached to a solar motor. So I have my lamp over here and as I do the experiment, I want you guys to make some observations. That is super bright. Um, I want you guys to make some observations and predictions about what's gonna happen. So I'm gonna start the solar panel close up and you'll see that our fan starts moving. Now, what do you think is gonna happen to our fan as I start to move our solar panel further away from the light source? And we'll see just how far it takes before we start to lose some of our power. And it's not that far. So given this demonstration, can you guys think of some pros and cons to using solar energy uh, for electrical power? And also be thinking about how exactly does this even work? So what's the scientific process behind our solar panels and how they're working? And also why are solar panels black? So think about that. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and share with you guys my screen so we can look more into detail about those questions I just asked you guys. Um, so let me start my, oops, stop that screen share and let me screen share my desktop. There we go. Um, so take a look at our little slide here. We just have some quick vocabulary that we're gonna go over first. Uh, so number one says a blank resource is any natural resource that humans use to generate energy. Uh, so what do you think should go in that blank? And hopefully you guys said, I probably already mentioned this word already, an energy resource. It, again, it's any natural resource. In this case, we're talking about solar and geothermal as our natural resources. And these energy resources are used by converting the energy of that resource into a form of energy that is useful to people. So think about how you've seen solar energy in particular used. And then number two, energy is found in many forms, but can't be created or destroyed. So do y'all think that is true or false? And then why? And then number three, much of the energy we get from natural resources comes from the conversion of potential energy. So that's stored energy, and it's converting it into what kind of energy. And I'll give you guys a hint. The kind of energy is also known as uh, the energy of motion or movement. Uh, so for number two, hopefully you guys said that that statement is true. So energy is not created or destroyed. When we are using these energy resources like solar and geothermal, we're simply converting that energy source into a new energy source, mostly electrical energy. And then uh, number three, hopefully you guys said that's kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is the energy of motion. Uh, so you saw examples of that conversion when Mr. Broughton was showing you an example of the wind turbines moving and the dams also moving from wind and water movement. Uh, so let's talk about solar energy. So this is the one most people are familiar with. Um, here in the U.S., about 1.7% of our energy comes from solar energy. So it's actually not a lot. Uh, but solar energy is simply energy received by Earth from the sun in the form of radiation. And it can be used to heat buildings directly or it can be converted into electricity by solar cells. So I'm gonna let you guys watch just a clip of this video and it helps explain how that solar energy is being converted into usable energy for us to use. Light from the sun stimulates electrons on a solar panel. These electrons create DC, or direct current electricity. Solar electricity travels from the panels on your roof through an inverter to the circuit breaker panel of your building. An inverter changes DC electricity into usable AC, or alternating current electricity, before sending it to the breaker panel of your building. 
Your home uses that electricity to power the electronic devices we use every day. It's like having your own power plant on your roof with an endless supply of clean energy. I'm gonna stop the video there. Light from the sun stimulates electricity. And then we're gonna go to our next slide. Um, so in our next slide, we see an example of uh, solar energy that y'all are probably familiar with. I love these solar lights. Um, so solar lights, think about some of the pros and cons to using solar energy. And I actually experienced this this week. Uh, so on nice sunny days, I have beautiful solar lights in the front of the house. However, it's been rather cloudy and rainy these last few days. So I didn't have any of my lights turn on. Uh, so these pictures were taken over the weekend. So luckily I took those pictures before we had these cloudy days. Uh, but that could be a downfall to using uh, solar energy. And these are smaller solar panels, so they're actually not able to store a lot of that uh, energy. And then in our next slide, uh, this is an example of a solar panel. This is actually our facility. It's our building. Um, so here in, in 2004, the Sun Club donated this solar panel to our facility uh, from Green Mountain Energy, and it produces about one kilowatt or 1000 watts um, of energy. And a watt is just the basic unit of measure for electrical power. Um, and something cool that I learned, so one kilowatt will power about 60 bulbs. Uh, so this was just meant to supplement our energy uh, source out here. It wasn't meant to fully power our building. Um, and also one kilowatt will also power only two 32 inch TVs. Uh, so I learned a lot about what kilowatts will power what. Uh, so if we look at our vocabulary, solar energy is an example of a blank resource because it is so plentiful, it can't be used up. So what do we call those uh, natural resources that are so plentiful that they essentially won't be used up? So we call those inexhaustible. And the sun, for the most part, will always be there. Um, it's not going to burn up in any of our lifetime. Uh, so that's why we consider solar energy an inexhaustible resource. And then our next one is geothermal energy. And geothermal energy can use, be used in a variety of different ways. The most common way would be energy for electricity. And geothermal energy is energy in the form of heat that is found inside our Earth. So we're going to watch a quick little video clip of geothermal energy, and then we'll discuss it. Planet Earth. It's hot and full of energy. If you've ever observed an erupting volcano, sat in a geothermal hot spring, or visited the geysers at Yellowstone National Park, you've experienced geothermal energy. The deeper you travel into the Earth, the hotter it gets. The Earth's crust is made of rocks and water. Underneath the Earth's crust is a layer of hot molten rock called magma, which is even hotter than the sun's surface. This earth heat, also called geothermal energy, is a clean, renewable source of both power and heat. The energy from less than 10 kilometers deep contains 50,000 times more energy than all the oil and natural gas resources in the world. Globally, geothermal currently generates enough electricity to meet the needs of 60 million people. We can harness this vast energy by developing geothermal power projects, or geopower. Using today's technology, we can locate and drill into the geothermal resource at only a few kilometers deep and capture the rising hot water and steam. Releasing a small amount of that heat in the right way can create electricity, and the formation water is re-injected back into the same reservoir underground to be reheated and recycled. Binary turbine power plants use hot formation water to vaporize another fluid. The second fluid drives a turbine and generator to produce electricity. This closed loop system produces no emissions and has one of the... And we're going to stop it there. So again, you see in this example, geothermal energy is creating and releasing that steam. And it's that steam that is being used to turn a turbine, which is then uh, allowing a generator to work to produce that electricity. So similar to that wind and water energy, we're also using steam uh, to create movement to help turn turbines and generators. Uh, so it's also a different form of kinetic energy. And then we can also use that geothermal energy for heating and cooling in our homes and buildings. Uh, so this one is something that's more easily attainable for, pe for residents. Uh, so we can, in the winter time, so what they do is uh, people can drill inside the earth 
and they go underground. And sometimes it doesn't even have to be that deep uh, when they dig underground and they put the pipes underground. So in the winter, water circulating inside uh, the sealed loop system. So these pipes, they absorb heat from the earth and it carries that heat uh, through the pipe into a heat exchanger. And then uh, when it's in that heat exchanger, the water is being compressed at a higher temperature and it's sent to the warm air. Uh, it's sending that warm air indoor to be distributed into the homes. And then in the summertime, it's doing the opposite. So it's reversing the system. Uh, it's removing that hot air from homes. It's pushing it underground and then it's cooling and it goes back into the house. Uh, so some buildings actually have uh, these geothermal heating and cooling systems. Even here in Dallas ISD, we have a few schools that have this system. Now there are some pros and cons to this system. Uh, so you can see here in this map, depending upon where you live, uh, this map is depicting at well depths of 30 to 60 feet. This is the average temperature underground. So you can see that the further north you are, the cooler it's gonna be underground versus in the su uh, southern part of the state. And then you can see that you really don't have to dig that far down to get into warmer temperatures. So for typical residential areas, if you were to install something like this in your home, um, just a short few meters down, uh, the average temperature is between five to 15 degrees Celsius, and that's about 41 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So you really don't have to dig that deep when, when these systems are being installed. And then you can see that for industrial uses, they really go further deep down into the earth uh, to those much hotter temperatures. And then for your challenge question today, think of the pros and cons to using solar and geothermal sources. Now I will say that again, in the US, solar energy accounts for 1.7% and geothermal accounts for only 0.4%. Uh, so think about why these aren't widely used resources yet. And then just uh, some information I found out, Medrano Middle School here in DISD in 2008 was the first DISD school to utilize a geothermal pump. And it's estimated that it saved that school about $110,000 a year in energy savings. And then below I put the names of some other schools that also have uh, geothermal heating. Uh, there's Dan Wesley Holmes, Bush Elementary, Siegelville North, and there's probably others, but these were just the ones I came across. Now I will say uh, Madrano also had some problems with its um, geothermal heating. They were actually made the newspaper and uh, TV on NBC5 in 2019. Their AC went out because their geothermal pump quit working. And because these pumps in that system are deep underground, they had a hard time trying to fix it. Um, so it does have its flaws as well. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop screen sharing. And that's all I have for you guys today. We're going to pass it back to Dr. Gorman and he's going to answer any questions. Okay, because of the time, we're not going to answer any questions right now. During this field trip, students discovered that some of the Earth's energy resources are available on a nearly perpetual basis. Others can be renewed over a relatively short period of time. And some energy resources, once depleted, are essentially non-renewable. Uh, Ms. Fuller told you about fossil fuels. Mr. Monroe told you about nuclear energy. Mr. Broughton discussed biomass, wind, and hydropower. And Ms. Ramirez did a program on geothermal and solar. Uh, Thank you for attending. Uh, we'd like for you to tell us how we did. You'll go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback, fill out a very short form. We appreciate your information and we look forward to seeing you again.